Well, you might as well, you know, get whatever you can because you never know if it's useful. So, hi, my name's Doug Lyon, I'm a media lecturer at Brighton University. Um, what do you think about the hyper reality in reality television? Well, I think you've got a complicated theory there that you try to apply to something that. Um, Like, first of all, r reality TV has not really got anything to do with reality. So we, are, we have to be clear that we're not talking about reality. Uh, and in a way, even this isn't reality. As soon as you start putting a camera there and you're aware of the frame and my microphone and then you're... We're having a chat, Jade, but it's a mediated chat now because now we're aware that there's another agenda to this and we don't really know where the material's going to go and are you going to get what you need. So as soon as you go into production on something, you're, you're creating a narrative for an audience. And whether that narrative would have been there if you hadn't have done your thing is hard to tell isn't it so what we do know around most reality tv from big brother to celebrity get me out of here to the only way is essex or any of those things is that the situations are set up it's a setup in a in a tv set it's literally a setup so there's nothing real about that. It's a stage. It's a media stage. And then producers are getting, getting people into situations designed to make them more antagonistic or more flirty or wind them up a bit and then give them some booze so that they get off with each other. I mean, the whole thing's very kind of hyped because what the audience are wanting is a mixture of the love story that pops out of it or the the bullying dynamic or the the victim or the weirdo or all of these kind of types that we're very used to now I mean you don't really come across those in your everyday you wouldn't normally come across those types in your everyday life but now because we're so used to watching people be ritualistically humiliated as a form of entertainment, we, we are getting hardwired more to see things like that. So that's the hyper-reality loop is you watch something that you think is in some way... Or say, for example, you watch... This isn't reality TV, but say you watch Take Me Out, which I think is worse than Hitler... I think that is the fucking worst programme on TV. But you watch a, you know, a row of girlies with their f hands on the buzzers looking a certain way and you think, not, in, not consciously in your mind, but you think, oh, that's, so that's what it looks like to be chosen as a pretty girlie for a programme like that. So I'll look like that. So that then lads who like that will like that look. But that's when it starts to get a bit strange because then you're copying something because you think that's good but they've made it up but it's like a cartoon version of reality it's got things turned up and things turned down because normal reality is boring I mean if you ever watch the live feed on Big Brother before it's edited I mean there's just no there's nothing there's nothing going on most of normality is n not really anything going on so when you get producers kind of pulling out these plot lines from kind of putting them together and, uh, you know, it's very constructed. Do you think producers have the control of reality television then? I do think, well, I don't know if it's producers or whether it's directors. That would be an interesting thing to get uh, under the skin of a bit more about how storylines are created. And I think it's a mixture of you'll have directors and executive producers who are kind of working together. Something like Big Brother is a really big team of people when you've got like 50 cameras on 24-7. They've probably got whole shifts of people who are 
developing certain strands or plot lines but well, I guess per I can only really talk personally because it's not like I'm saying I'm an expert about all of this. My experience of people is they're quite predictable. So if you look at um, Jerry Springer, have you ever seen that? So like you get your, you know, there you start the program and it's uh, I slept with my wife's sister's daughter's cat. And then you've got three people sat there and you know what's going to happen. From the moment you look at it, th it's so predictable what's going to happen because people are quite easy to wind up and go, oh, that's terrible and, you know, you need to let the world know how you feel about that. So that person feels very flattered by the fact that people think they're interesting and they think they're going to be heard and respected for their point of view they're not they're going to be hu humiliated in public and brought together with somebody that will end up having some stupid cat fight on stage because I mean it goes back to Roman times or other times when you know a lot of our forms of, e of entertainment historically were things like cock fighting or dog fighting or bear baiting or um what it the Romans used to do in the, you know, like gladiator stuff. I mean, human beings are quite cruel by nature. I mean, witch burning was very popular. Burn the witch. You know, that'd be you, dear, for a start. <laughs> Back in the day, burn the witch. It wasn't a punishment. It was a form of entertainment. You know, that kind of stuff. I mean, human beings are incredibly cruel. I honestly think most reality TV is incredibly cruel and I, and I do think there is a voyeuristic pleasure a sadistic voyeuristic pleasure in watching people be r ritualistically humiliated on the telly but they have signed up for it so then arguably you could say well they're masochistic then because they've they've signed the contract they're probably getting paid for it they think something about being famous and being on telly is going to get them more girlfriends or something they think they're going to get something out of it well s historically that doesn't seem to be a very successful way of uh, of making yourself popular being on telly being in that environment whether you're the winner or the loser it within the game or within that environment later on there's not a lot of evidence to show that people have come through that reality tv or X Factor type competitions there's very few people that seem to be coming out of it benefited by the process but then you know what you have to ask yourself is are you looking at the participants in that or are you looking at is it aud audience theory that you're looking at is it about the effect that it has on you as a viewer and whether you think ah Maybe the reason why I haven't got a boyfriend is because my eyelashes aren't big enough because all those <laughs> girls on uh, Take Me Out, they've all got massive eyelashes and look, they're on telly and they got, she got picked, she's got whatever, bigger something than me and blah, blah, blah. That's what I need to do. I mean, that's where hyperality starts to kick in is you start to modify how you look because you think something looks better because you've watched something. And then if that becomes a fashion that everybody starts getting really oh, big things on their eyes then that means that when it comes to a TV thing they're going to turn it up even more which is why you get an Essex girl stereotype isn't it you know I mean that is a cartoon stereotype of hyper femininity everything's turned up you know so then you start ending up with girls looking like drag queens so then that's kind of interesting. I mean, how far how far can it go? I've got a sneeze in my nose. Um, it's not there yet. What else? What, ask me something else. Well, it's funny you said about Gladiator because um, sort of before we came back to uni, I was thinking about doing sort of like comparison from Gladiator times to now and how like X Factor is really similar. It's like a modern day version. Then I sort of didn't go down the road because I thought would I have to do loads of research into history, which I didn't really like, not want, not, not want to do, but. Well, you've got, a, you've got a common thread that seems to be coming up in your work that's something around 
the relationship between like the sadomasochistic thing now in the gladiator days I guess I don't really know what the masochistic thing about that was because it wasn't really like <coughs> excuse me the people in that position didn't really have a choice the gladiators were effectively slaves who if they survived got a great lifestyle but they could be killed at any moment it wasn't a very good deal unless they got to the end and retired to enjoy it and everybody else was just mincemeat I mean so I would say that in the days of the gladiator realm that was an almost purely sadistic voyeuristic setup but what we seem to have replaced it by is people willingly going in signing up to be fed to the lions like they think they're going to get something out of it so what is that about that's quite strange and I think that's why Zizek's very good at kind of pulling that to bits so I think that would I think that should be your focus for now until the end of January is just focus on yeah the hyper realism thing it's like with the, the you know the porn project about the effects of technology on the consumption of porn have you watched that if you haven't watch it again because they really struggled with so much material so they were doing something about pornography so they had to look at the feminist debate they had to look at politics of representation and the industry all of those three things could have been a dissertation in themselves but it wasn't their focus their focus was the effects of new technology on the consumption of pornography in this country now so as soon as they'd done the background and they could take things out and go that's interesting but we're not we're not doing that that's when it starts to really help you so at the moment you've kind of got you've got a bit of Lacan going on a bit of psychoanalysis a bit of Zizek a bit of Baudrillard's hyperreality I mean those three are serious theorists each one of those is a you know a dissertation in itself but I'm, I'm okay with you just pulling out an aspect of one of their theories and just going I know this is a much bigger theory but I'm just applying this bit of it to an aspect of this as a focus so what what um, text were we looking at particularly around reality TV or well, where's your interest at the moment third pill video and that's where um the sado stick the what love what how do you say it sado sado masochistic yeah that comes from um a book by mark andrew andrew jet um, and then obviously the third pill sort of like relates to that um, about like who has the pa like that's where I sort of related to who has the power yeah. because we we need to fulfil the pleasure so does audiences have it or do producers have it sort of thing yeah <clears throat> okay so that is an in that's that's a good question who has the power I think that's a really good question in lots of things so so tonight if you had a night in and watch news night tonight when we've got Russell Brand and Nigel Farage in a head-to-head -head debate like that really tells you something about who's got the power in our society at the moment as far as I can tell this is just my opinion all of the issues around immigration all together really don't amount to very much about the economics of this country and what's going on compared to global warfare major tax fraud things like that i mean it's a, it's a pittance it's not really the issue but we really do have a, an issue with otherness and somebody coming over here nicking our jobs getting benefits they don't deserve so that's not okay so we have to persecute them I mean, these are people that have left their country in fear of their lives or their families' lives. That's why they're here, because their life's awful. And, w and what do we welcome them with? Persecution. I mean, 
that's cruel in my world. Like the way we treat people who are at the lower end of our society in terms of opportunities that have got available to them. We don't look after them. We totally begrudge them and treat them really cruelly. Strangely, forgetting that 150 years ago we ran the slave trade, potted around the world, taking over countries and bringing their people back to service for nothing as slaves. So how are we in a position to have that point of view? It doesn't make any sense. But we are a bit cruel. I mean, it's just, isn't it? What's wrong with being kind? You know, why can't we just look after people? Why, why do we make a form of entertainment out of cruelty? People really wanting to do something and, mate, you can't sing, so don't go on X Factor because you're just going to look silly. Why has nobody told you you can't sing? You know, you can sing in the shower to yourself or to your mates and have a night, but you're not going to be on the stage with Simon Cowell going, you're brilliant. It's not going to happen. You're going to be humiliated. And then that seems to be a form of... Ent Why is that entertaining? See somebody humiliated? I don't, get, I don't get it. I really don't get it. But your question, who's got the power in that, situa that situation, is very interesting. So what it looks like who's got the power is Simon Cowell and his team of people who have allegedly got the expertise to decide who's good and who's not. But without those people who, wait, who, who get humiliated, you wouldn't have a programme. Well, what do they get out of it? They must think they're going to get something out of it. I mean, that would be... I would be really interested to see some interviews, which are probably online don't have to do them yourself with people two five years after that experience talking about it from a retrospective reflective point of view that'd be really interesting about how they felt about that in hindsight and who's got the power because I mean Simon Cowell's a mega businessman he's got a record label he's got all of this stuff so it's just a business that's what it looks like to me it looks like Somebody's got a nice big business here where they're getting people to volunteer to be kind of vetted to see whether they could be the next superstar or not. But, I mean, they don't even make the act, just the X Factor. They're creaming off the talent to make records. They're making money from X Factor. And then there's the ITV2 or whatever version of it, the whatever it is, behind the scenes thing and then the, the making of the behind the scenes thing, you know what I mean it's like, it's, it's just a media factory of shit, endlessly regurgitated and the power is in the people who are making the money out of it, which is the big corporate businesses not any of the people who are on it but um, I mean this might be going off on one but if you were, like, did you watch Sonia's fetish one? I mean, it is so fascinating when you look at it in that light. And because it, it's not necessarily sexual, all that world. But it looks like somebody's got a sadomasochistic relationship. It looks like the dominant person is bullying the submissive person. From the outside, that's what it looks like. <laughs> but the submissive person previously has said what they want. So, in actual fact, the, dominant, the seemingly dominant person is serving the needs of the submissive person in a way that they want, in a pre-arranged pre setup. So it's the opposite of what it looks like. Now, if you apply that sadomasticate relationship into TV and audience theory and watching ritualistic humiliation and... I mean, God, if you go to Japan, look at Japanese TV, they turn the volume up a lot more on the ritualistic humiliation. You know, you end up with people in hot houses in the middle of the desert for two days, buried in the sand, and I mean, they really do turn it up a lot. I mean, why do we enjoy that? Well, I mean, that could be your only question, is what is it about human beings that we enjoy watching somebody suffer is that a voyeuristic sadistic thing that we have in us human beings seems to be very popular seems to be in every culture well every media culture 
And why are you interested in that, Jade? I mean, that's the thing to ask yourself as well, is like, what is driving your interest behind that? What What is it about it that you want to work out? Is there something in you that you're trying to work out as a result of all this? Is there? I mean, that's what I want everybody on their practice-based dissertations to do is work something out about who are you as a young woman in the society that we live in now, having done, just finishing off a media studies degree, might not feel like you're finishing it off at the moment, it's, it's a long way to the finishing line, but it's only six months and you'll be out the other end of all of this and it'll all be a bit of a dream. But you will know that you ran a project all on your own as a producer, director, researcher, interviewer, editor. And you'll feel different about it. You'll be empowered as a result of it. You will at the end of this project. At the moment, it's a little bit... You don't really know, but um, and my guess is that you can f have a sense of feeling... I'm f starting to feel a bit more empowered by this project, maybe it's bubbling under. People who go onto reality TV are not coming off it empowered, they're coming off it disempowered. And then, so you get knocked out of the first round of X Factor because you can't sing and nobody's told you and then they say, mate, that is the worst thing I've ever heard. And then you spend the rest of your life, every time you go out to a nightclub with somebody going, Oh, aren't you Jade off X Factor? You can't sing, can you? Imagine that. Every time you go out, you go and buy a bag of sugar in your trackies and somebody's going, Ooh, you're thingy off the telly, aren't you? I can't imagine that that is a pleasant result of that. That's just carrying on being humiliated for the rest of your life. I mean, we're crazy, human beings. I don't, you know... But then, you know, there is something about doing something that's scary and not giving in to yourself that I can't do it and doing it that does make you feel better about yourself as a person. That you will, you will get that from doing what you're doing now. There'll come a point where you go, I did that, I can do that. Now I could walk into a production company and go, I'm not saying I'm the best or I know everything, but I'll give it a go. So, my top tip to Jade Sturt is get a couple of little bits of theory and apply it to something contained, asking the question, who's got the power? Is it who it looks like who's got the power that's actually got the power? And something about that sadomasochistic relationship and why, why is that? so entertaining to us. I think that's all you need to ask at the moment until your first cut's finished and then we'll see where we're at then. So see if you can find clips from uh, some kind of reputable source TED Talks or that kind of stuff. Just pause it for a second let's just see if there's anything I want to say. Yeah. So reality TV is a staple of our culture and part of the reason for that is it's quite cheap it's quite cheap TV to make. So that's one thing. And my personal opinion about it is that a lot of people carry dissatisfaction in their life about how they are or what they do. So if you want to elevate yourself or your self-esteem, rather than doing something to earn feeling better about yourself, what a lot of people do is get into what reality TV creates is a lot of gossip. Creates a lot of gossip. Oh, did you see her last night? She turned, when she turned around and she said to him, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff is about putting somebody down to put yourself up a bit. It's like, oh, I'm better than them. To me, that's the root of all that cruelty, is 
people who don't feel that great about themselves making themselves feel better about themselves by putting somebody else down that's my soundbite for you Jodester